is a globular cluster M3. Uh, it was one of the early clusters that I studied. Uh, I was very, very, very fortunate. Uh, when I came to UNC Charlotte, uh, my PhD dissertation was in the physiology of memory and learning. So there was not a lot of research opportunities available for me in the physics department. And I didn't, didn't do any research. This back in the old days, as some of you will remember, uh, this was not a research institution. Uh, I'd only been here about a year or so when it asked me to teach astronomy. I said, well, I've never had an astronomy course. <laughs> so, well, I am interested in astronomy. So uh, I studied it as much as I could. And I went into the classroom and said, I don't know very much about astronomy, but we have a very good book here, and we're going to learn a lot of astronomy this semester. That, that could have been the best astronomy course I've ever taught. But anyhow, I taught this course for 10 years, I guess, and I, even I wrote an astronomy textbook. And uh, when the textbook got published, uh, it, you know, I sort of didn't have much to do, and it occurred to me, you know, I've been teaching astronomy for 10 years. I've written an astronomy textbook, and I've never done any astronomy. Uh, those of you who, well, in any field, not just science, in any field. Uh, when you just talk about something, you don't really do it. <laughs> That's a little questionable. Uh, so I got a reassignment of duties, uh, Grant, and went up to Chapel Hill, and met some people there. And uh, very, very, very fortunate for me. Uh, contact with an astronomer up there, a very well-known astronomer actually, uh, called Bruce Corn, Bruce Carney, and he became my mentor. So, uh, quite unusual for a person to have a mentor who's younger than they are, but I got a bit of a late start, so Bruce has been very, very helpful to me. And uh, he got me, uh, with his name on the proposal, uh, I could observe almost anywhere I wanted him. I got some wonderful opportunities uh, that I wouldn't have normally gotten. And M3 uh, was one of the clusters that he was interested in. And much to my surprise, he turned the whole project over to me very early, uh, which was a, an incredibly lucky break for me uh, because, as I'll talk about later, it gave me contact with the Italian astronomers because the astronomers in Bologna and in Rome were very, very interested. So I'm going to quickly go through a couple of papers. Uh, the first, well, it wasn't the first paper, but it's the first really big paper uh, was on the data from M3. When we first started this, Bruce said, uh, "We think I think this is pretty good data. You ought to be able to get light curves on about 150 stars." Well, the data was much, much better than he expected. We, we found uh, light curves initially on over 200 variables, and made some other uh, interesting. Uh, again, a lucky break. Uh, almost as soon as we published that paper, and we used standard reduction techniques to get the data, uh, two French astronomers developed a brand new analysis tool that was much, much more powerful as far as finding very good stars were. So we reanalyzed the data. Uh, this particular person's undergraduate student, uh, and he and I worked on this data, and with this new analysis technique, we could take the exact same data that we'd analyzed in the old way, found out everything we found out in the old way, except we discovered new variables, because we had, uh, we had a more powerful software for identifying the variable stars. The way this works is you take on an observing run maybe 300 images, and then the software looks at them and systematically picks out the ones that are varying over periods of time and identifies the variable for you. Uh, it has some drawbacks, but it's great for discovering new variables. Uh, oh, uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, the astronomers in Italy were very, very interested in this particular cluster. And <coughs> Beverly and I were in Italy. We stopped by Bologna. And, uh, Oh, yeah, you're, you're the one that has the data on him. Great, yeah, yeah. He said, well, we'd love for you to come over to Italy and work with us. And so uh, I did. We went over there for six months and, and worked together. And the agreement was that uh, we would publish our observational data, 
Bruce and I, and they would publish their observational data, and then we would work together, with the, these were theoreticians, uh, with my data, because they knew that the data we got at Kitt Peak was better than the data that they got in their research. So this is Gisela Clementini, oops, Gisela Clementini, and she's one of the world's leading experts on double mode pulsar. It turns out that M3 is unique, both in terms of the number of double mode pulsators it has and the uh, heights. Uh, there is a particular double mode pulsator in M3 that has ne had never been observed before. It actually switched its pulsation mode uh, from one fundamental mode to, uh, from one primary mode to another primary mode. So very, uh, I'm gonna try and get through this quickly. I seem like I'm rushing. <laughs> uh, this technique is so powerful that uh, data that is previously oh, I'm sorry, this is, this is Carla Cacciari. Uh, she took the data and worked on something that was thought to be true at the time. As, when you, uh, as many of you know, whenever you have a periodic curve, you can do a Fourier uh, decomposition analysis on it. That is, you can get coefficients that weight each of the various wavelengths by a certain amount, so that when you add them all together, you reproduce your curve. As long as it's periodic, it will do that. And at the time, uh, most astronomers believed that these uh, Fourier coefficients of the pulsation of the light curve gave an indication of some of the intrinsic properties in the star that you can't observe directly, like its luminosity or its mass surface temperature and things like that. Uh, lots and lots of papers have been published suggesting that this is probably true. Carl has shown absolutely not. It's completely wrong. There's no correlation at all between the Fourier decomposition uh, coefficients and the intrinsic uh, properties of the stuff. So that's a very important result. I'm going to skip this because I really want to get to what I'm most interested in, what I think you're most interested in. Yeah. But I'm going to end with this one because this is my last lecture and this was my last big paper. Uh, some uh, Bulgarians uh, at uh, Europe are so and uh, Rudy Kirtev had taken some very, very, very good data of an important cluster, uh, M15. M3, uh, globular clusters are normally divided into two categories, booster hopper, one and Oosterhof two. Uh, this was done back in 1939. And at that time he said, this is the prototype of Oosterhofer type one, Oosterhofer type one, that's M3. And this is the prototype of type two, M15. So here we had data on the two most significant globular clusters as far as the study of globular clusters are concerned. Uh, this person here, Marcio Cadda, was concerned that the Bulgarian, with this data, people who he was working with as the theoretician, their uh, observ observers, uh, might not be able to analyze the data well enough. So he asked me if I would do it, and I said yes. Uh, huge, huge data. It took me three years to write this paper. Three years of almost constant frustration. <laughs> Tremendous amount of data to manipulate, to analyze, to sort out things. So I worked into that, and I wrote a paper draft and sent to all the people. Marcia said, well, this is pretty good, but you know, with this great database we have, we could do this. But, you know, another few months I did that. And then the paper came, you know, this is pretty good, we're getting there. But you know, with this great database, we could do this. So he did that, a relatively frustrating experience for me. Each of his suggestions made the paper much, much stronger than it was. But when I turned this paper into the publisher, I said, that's it for me. I'm never going to write another long paper again. A couple of years 